and welcome to another edition of the Hank Unplugged Podcast, a podcast that is committed to bringing the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet directly to your earbuds. Well, today I am taking a little detour because I'm not interviewing someone, I'm not bringing the most interesting, inspirational, informative person on the planet to you. I'm doing this Hank Unplugged podcast solo because I want to talk about something solo. I want to talk about the imprudence of solo scriptura. Not sola scriptura, but solo scriptura. I want to talk about the disease of rampant innovation and a failure to respect holy tradition. And I want to explain to you as well what I mean by holy tradition. But let me start by saying this. Blaise Pascal, who lived a very short life but made a transcendent difference, once said in the 17th century something that I think relates dynamically to our state in the 21st century. He said, truth is so obscure in these times and falsehood so established that unless we love the truth, we cannot know it. The trampling of truth in the secular sphere has well been nothing short of mind numbing. The unalterable verity that God created humanity, male and female, was now routinely regaled as transphobic. Sex-specific designations, designations such as woman, female, mother, have been neutered by such linguistic absurdities as, and I'm sure you've heard this phrase, pregnant lactating, and postpartum individuals. Even our newest female addition to the Supreme Court seems at a loss to define the word woman. And adding to the confused cultural conundrum, the B in LGBTQ, and I should add the plus, and there's other letters I could add as well, but the B in LGBTQ is quite evidently at odds with the T. Bisexual, or B, implies two options. While, on the other hand, transgender, the T, entails a dizzying array of gender identities devoid of common sense and devoid of biological reality. And even that but scratches the sated surface of, well, Western woke wisdom and adding insult to injury, multitudes of young people have been effectively reduced to generational lab rats, lab rats subject to an unholy triad of puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and irreversible surgical savageries. But it is not only secular incongruities that boggle the mind. Spiritual abnormalities have become increasingly bizarre as well. In the previous issue of the Christian Research Journal, I wrote an article An article in which I noted that the iconic apologist, Dr. William Lane Craig, believes Adam and Eve to be members of an animal species, a species of apes on which God affected physical and spiritual renovation some 750,000 to a million years ago. And in doing so, He lends currency to the untenable notion of broken pseudogenes, of junk DNA, using that as evidence for human-ape common ancestry. In other words, 
what the Creator designed as essential genomic regulatory and control elements. Dr. Craig devalues as dispensable evolutionary junk. In place of this kind of incessant innovation, he would have been better served to recognize that biology's Big Bang, I'm talking here about the Cambrian explosion, shatters his preferred version of the evolutionary paradigm in much the same way as Big Bang cosmology buttresses the opening words of Genesis. Well, in concert with the maxim, error begets error, Dr. Craig recently disclosed a second seminal shocker. In his reading of Genesis chapter 3, Romans chapter 5, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says he discovered, at least in effect, that the consensus of the church councils, the church fathers, well, they were all wrong respecting the mortality of Adam. They affirmed that Adam was created neither mortal nor immortal, that he was capable of both mortality and immortality, and that had he chosen the way of immortality and following the divine commandment, he would have received the gift of immortality as recompense. Craig, however, deems that to be dead wrong. In his opinion, Adam and Eve would have naturally died. They would have naturally died even if they hadn't fallen. And this despite the well-documented reality that this deadly aberration has been thoroughly considered and, of course, comprehensively debunked. And that's really what the essence of this Hank Unplugged podcast is about today. Now as capstone to the trifecta, Craig has added an age-old heresy rebutted by the Holy Church throughout her storied history. He's added the odd predilection that the progeny of Adam and Eve are not sinful from birth. They're not sinful, as Scripture says, from the time their mothers conceived them. Instead, Dr. Craig maintains that humans are conceived apart from the stain of original sin. In his words, there's nothing in Scripture to suggest that we inherit a corrupted human nature from Adam. Now, while he rightly rejects the notion of inherited guilt, he's persuaded based principally on an odd interpretation, at least from my perspective, of Romans chapter 5, that Pelagius, in effect, was right when he denied that humans inherit a corrupted nature from Adam. This, of course, historically is known as the heresy of Pelagianism. Instead, from Craig's perspective, humans repeat the sin of Adam. Well, the Pelagian heresy, of course, is nothing new. It has been comprehensively considered and rightly refuted. St. Augustine, for example, and I think this is the quintessential example, he cited the testimony of the canon, the teachings of the church fathers, and the contagion of inherited corruption to convincingly counter this unorthodox heresy. And added to that is the reality that the rule of faith that was articulated in Canon 110 of the African Code, which was later ratified by the Seventh Ecumenical Council, it clearly spells out the inviolate reality that infants who could have committed no sin themselves, are nonetheless baptized for the remission of sins. Why? In order that what in them is the result of generation may be cleansed by regeneration. Moreover, Pelagianism has been roundly 
condemned by the Third Ecumenical Council and that in tandem with the sister sin of Nestorianism. So, I suppose here's the quintessential question. Why make such a big deal about an ancient heresy that has resurfaced in the present? Well, it is because the culture is progressively redefining what it means to be human. Moreover, when the biblical boundaries of humanity are blurred, the inconceivable becomes common fare. Who could have imagined an Apple corporation, one of the most significant tech companies in the history of the world, releasing an emoji of a pregnant man? Or who could conceive of a prestigious university nominating a biological male as woman of the year? Who could have envisioned? How could it have even come into our minds that a popular Protestant philosopher would pontificate that our primordial parents would have died even if they hadn't sinned? Or repudiating the essential Christian doctrine of original or of ancestral sin. And by the way, those terms can be used synonymously. In other words, it's not the word you use, it's the meaning that you pour into the word that is of greatest import. At any rate, what is happening in the culture has been aptly described as the madness of crowds. But what is now happening within Christianity might best be attributed to the imprudence of what I call solo scriptura, of rampant innovation and of disregard for holy tradition. And when I talk about holy tradition, I'm talking about holy tradition in the sense of neither an independent instance nor a complementary source of faith. After all, ecclesiastical understanding could not add anything to Scripture, but it is the only means to ascertain and to disclose the true meaning of Scripture. So holy tradition is, in fact, the authentic interpretation of Scripture. And in that sense, it's coextensive with Scripture. It's actually Scripture rightly understood. The heterodox have no key to the mind of Scripture. And as a result, they turn it into a wax nose. And never more egregiously than with the denial of original sin. To say that Adam's sin affected Adam and only Adam, and that our primordial parents' transgression caused no change in the constituent nature of humanity, or to say that the entirety of humanity is conceived and born in a state of righteousness, is not only to recapitulate the age-old Pelagian heresy, but it is to lay at the feet of the only wise God the suffering and death of innocent, preborn, and infant children. And while neither adults nor children bear the guilt of their ancestors, all indubitably suffer the contagion. And the oft-repeated words of Israel's quintessential king, Surely I was a sinner at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Or, as St. Gregory Palamas so eloquently explained, It was indeed Adam's soul that died. Adam's soul that died by becoming through his transgression separated from God. For bodily he continued to live after that time, even for 930 years. The death, however, that befell the soul because of the transgression not only crippled the soul and made man accursed, It also rendered the body itself subject to fatigue, to suffering, and to corruptibility, and, of course, finally handed it over to death. 
as such, even a conceptus is subject to death. To deny that we inherit a corrupted human nature from the first Adam is effectively to diminish the salvific significance of the second Adam. The salvific significance of the Christ. The Christ who came to set human nature free. The Christ who came to change the common curse into a shared blessing. The Christ who came to break through the triple barrier of which St. Nicholas Cabasius wrote in a remarkable work titled Life in Christ, where he said the Lord allowed men separated from God by the triple barrier of nature, sin, and death to be fully possessed of him and to be directly united to him by the fact that he has set aside each barrier in turn, that of nature by his incarnation, of sin by his death, and of death by his resurrection. Perhaps amidst the noise of modern-day innovations, we can as yet still hear the faint echo of Isaiah's earth-shattering pronouncement. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call his name Emmanuel, and he will save his people from their sins. Isaiah's prophetic words foreshadowed the breaking of the first barrier, the barrier of nature forever shattered by incarnation. The first barrier than that of a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life is removed by Christ's virgin birth. Furthermore, as Christ set aside the first of the triple barriers by his incarnation, so too he set aside the second by his death. And as with the first barrier, it is Isaiah who commands her attention, this time in riveting our gaze on the canvas of Christ's death. You probably know the words. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. As the Anthropos, as the God-man, the spotless Lamb of God, lived a perfectly sinless human life. He died a sinner's death to sufficiently atone once for all to the sins of all humanity. Without both natures, Christ's payment would have been insufficient as God. His sacrifice was sufficient to provide redemption for the sins of humankind as man. He did what the first Adam failed to do. For as in Adam all die, think the doctrine of original sin, so in Christ all will be made alive. And thus through his death, the second barrier, the barrier of sin, is forever set aside. Finally, the sting of death itself, the third and the final barrier, that barrier was forever voided through resurrection. Through the resurrection, the sting of death has been swallowed up in victory. Here, as with the first two barriers, Isaiah prophetically looks forward toward the resurrection of a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering as the earnest of our resurrection on the last day. After the suffering of the soul exuded Isaiah, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. In like fashion, our bodies will be resurrected from the dust of the ground. The mortal will be clothed with immortality. If Christ had not himself been resurrected, the promise that he will resurrect dry bones in scattered graves around the globe would be as empty as the tomb that guarantees its fulfillment. 
Vladimir Lossky, who's become one of my favorite theologians. He's one of the most brilliant of the 20th century. He summed up our salvation with typical eloquence and erudition. He said, what man ought to have attained by raising himself up to God, God achieved by descending to man. That is why the triple barrier which separates us from God, death, sin, nature, impassable for men, is broken through by God, and that in inverse order, beginning with the union of the separated natures and ending with victory over death. So here's the point. Here's the takeaway in this podcast. When the origins of death, sin, and nature are contradicted and confused, then the salvific significance of our Savior is compromised. And therefore, I felt the need in this podcast to weigh in. For surely, surely apart from the transcendent import of this matter, I would have opted out of the process of talking about this in the first place, particularly in that it involves critiquing someone that I truly hold in high regard. And yet, as Abram Kuyper, formerly Prime Minister of the Netherlands, so memorably said, when principles that run against your deepest convictions begin to win the day, then battle is your calling, pieces become sin. You must, at the price of dearest peace, lay your convictions bare before friend and enemy alike with all the fire of your faith. And this I do knowing full well that I have made egregious errors of my own, errors for which I have had to privately and publicly repent. In the end, it is my sincere hope that in place of solo scriptura, maybe another way of saying that is me and my Bible, in place of incessant innovation, what I'm talking about there is the need to go back to a state of perpetuation, perpetuating the faith once for all delivered to the church. So in place of solo scriptura and incessant innovation, as well as what I talked about before in this podcast, the disregard for holy traditions of the church, it is my prayer that the body of Christ might once again return to what has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. And as I close this podcast, let me say a few words about the Christian Research Journal. The three issues that I've talked about in this particular podcast, the issue of the origins of humanity, the origins of Adam and Eve, the issue of saying that Adam was created mortal, that he would have died even if he had not sinned, along with what I focused on mostly in the podcast the issue of someone now denying one of the essential doctrines of the historic Christian faith, the doctrine of original sin, or as it's sometimes referred to, ancestral sin. These issues are not only important, but issues that we deal with in the Christian Research Journal, because the journal, in effect, is a magazine that we use to equip you to exercise truth and experience life. So, These issues I've expounded in detail in former, and I'll continue to expound in future editions of the Christian Research Journal, a journal in which we bring to you the minds that are speaking to the relevant issues of our day. And again, the purpose is to equip you. Because if there's ever a time in which we need discernment, 
That time is today, and that's why I started out with the quote from Blaise Pascal, who once again said, truth is so obscure in these times and falsehoods so established that unless you love the truth, you cannot know it. Truth has been trampled in the streets. You have an opportunity to set truth once again upon its rightful pillar. Thanks so much for tuning in to this edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast. We look forward to seeing you next time with more of Hank Unplugged. So long for now.